Welcome to the LipPills.com podcast. It is the first one of 2021. We hope you are all well and we hope and wish you all a prosperous new year. I am Dan Morgan and our present to you for the first LipPills.com podcast is a full quota of the LipPills.com team. I'm joined by Joel Rabinovitz, Ollie Connolly and Mark Wakefield. Gents, hope you're all well. And I want to start with the ever-longing question of 2021, Joel, what is wrong with Liverpool Football Club? Um, we have we have come back to work as a, as a team in 2021 and, and been met with, um, for the first time, I'd say, in our Liverpool.com formation, uh, a Liverpool team that is struggling to form quite badly, um, I think we can say. And it would only take a couple of wins to put that right. But at the same time, it's the first time, certainly since I've started this job, where I've thought, OK, we've got a, a problem here that lasts beyond one game. Yeah, it's uh, uncharted territory for us, really. I don't know, listeners might not be aware, but Dan and I were there from the start, launched in July 2019. So the start of the season when Liverpool won the league, went on to win 26 of the first 27 games that season in the league. Um, and we thought it was great. Every week, we were writing <laughs> about how everyone was brilliant. The team was flawless. They couldn't. You were always running out of kind of superlatives to describe them. Um, and obviously, kind of there were the low points last season, um, the league being stopped and the, the Watford game, and there were kind of isolated moments. Atletico Madrid, where we we had to cover kind of chastening defeats. But yeah, you're right. There hasn't really been a, a kind of sustained run of performances quite like this one um because i think what you in the past you've always felt when liverpool have had a really bad day under klopp there was always going to be a quick reaction in the next game you never really get two back to back so i think i i kind of was disappointed with the west brom draw and the manner that kind of liverpool allowed that game to drift after kind of starting so well getting the early goal looking on top and just didn't get the second and let it get out of their grasp but i was expecting them to go to newcastle and make a bit of a statement and, and kind of be angry, really, which is what you've seen in the past. And Liverpool have, have dropped points in those scenarios. And it was just so drab. It was so flat. It was so predictable. And then you felt the way the fixtures panned out for them and um, the schedule this year, they had a nice rest to Southampton. And you thought, look, this is a team who isn't going to sit back quite as much. They will press. There should be more space for Liverpool to kind of play their normal game and counter-attack and things like that. And then obviously they concede within what was it two minutes and I remember feeling as soon as England scored that goal there's a high chance this game just ends 1-0 because it's it's so unusual now watching Liverpool feeling like the goal just isn't going to come whatever they do however much they've got the ball in the final third um decision making's off players just not doing the basic things that you know they can do and the confidence that I think that is above all right now the biggest difference is that they just don't look like they believe they can turn these games around um, and I'm sure we'll come on to talk about it. There's obviously the cup game on Friday and it might just be the, a big home game at Anfield against United with where they are in the league and their form um, might just be what Liverpool need to snap them out. But yeah, you're right to say um, since we started this job, none of us are used to this situation at all. I think the problem, Mark, is the, the predictability of it. It's in terms of results in recent games, but also in terms of just how the games have gone. You know, I think there was a there was a, a sense that Newcastle was going to be turgid and, and horrible and, and and difficult in the immediacy of West Brom. And then, you know, you sort of see that Southampton team and you think, OK, you know, th- there's there's a lot of creativity there potentially in midfield. And, and you think that it's a game where it will be different in that Southampton will come out at Liverpool as opposed to Newcastle and West Brom. And then the thing you don't want to do, you go and do, which is conceded in the first two minutes. And then, you know, I think Joel referenced it on one of our calls this week. The minute Liverpool conceded that goal, you felt that the game had a really good chance of ending 1-0, and it did. And for the first time, I think we're seeing a, a predictability in the, the bluntness of, of Liverpool in an attacking form, which is a funny thing to say. Yeah, I definitely agree. I mean, i say it's an interesting one. We've talked about, like, you know, like Salah and Mane, for me, you know, they've been so good in the attacking sense for Liverpool over the last few years but like it just seems like they've just been man marked to death at you know get every single game they play like every time Mane or Salah gets the ball you know they've got three or four players around them they just can't do anything they're supposed to do but on the flip side of that you could argue that if more defenders are around them that means it leaves more space but there's just not there's not a lot of movement on off the ball um in terms of the attacking sense at the moment um 
what reason that is, I'm not too sure tactically, but yeah, they just seem to be a bit predictable, you know, couple of, a couple of games like, I mean, West Brom, you know, the team sat deep, you know, you knew what they were going to do, and you just up to them to break them down, but there's just no moment of like magic, there was no, I say, movement off the ball, trying to like penetrate them, or even just trying something different, you know, going straight 4-4-2, playing for set pieces a bit like they do, giving them a bit of their own medicine, they didn't do that. Newcastle again, there was no real fight to try and get the goal. And then against Southampton, like Joel said, once Ings scores that goal, we just felt like well, that's the worst thing that possibly could have happened. Because in the past, if Liverpool can see, you thought, OK, they conceded, but this team believes that they're going to go and score again, if not equalise, and then go and score a winner. That's just what they've done in the last couple of years. But just recently, for one reason or another, we don't what that reason is, whether it's, you know, Fatigue. I don't. I don't. Like I say, I don't buy into fatigue at all. You know, they've had they had eight games rest before the West Brom game, you know, three days before the Newcastle game when most teams had two. You know, and then they had a few games uh, days before the Southampton game. So that's not a, an excuse in my opinion. But you know, when they've got the the squad has been so stretched with the injuries. You know, the same 12, 13, 14 players have basically played pretty much all season long with um, the injuries. So. Fatigue might be catching up in terms of the long run, but in terms of over Christmas, that shouldn't be an excuse. But yeah, they just seem to be running out of ideas. Attacking, attacking wise, defensively, they've been pretty stable, but that's because a lot of teams are just basically sitting back and just saying, well, we'll cut, you cut, try and do what you do. We're just going to sit back and just defend you with all our lives. And that's worked so far for the opposition anyway. Ali, I, I really enjoyed your your piece that related to to basically how Harry Kane has performed this season and, and the positions he's performed in um, and relating that and, and putting that to Liverpool's attack in recent games at least. I mean, there is a there is a sense of what this management team has done really well over the past few years is they've basically got Liverpool in the position to then go and fire the bullets that they need. You know, we will get you to the hockey to to, yeah. to throw your double twenties and darts to use that terminology. You know, but you then have to take those chances when they arrive, or you have to make those chances. And yeah, I mean, not to not to suddenly put someone like Mourinho on a pedestal, but th there is a semblance here that you know Liverpool are struggling with the thing that they are they have built an identity on first and foremost. You know, they've built an identity on this this form of attacking, this form of counter pressing this form of being in certain places when the ball breaks down so they can transition none of that really works if you're not doing the thing at the end of it which is creating the chance that gives you the goal yeah and it was really interesting those two newcastle games that they weren't like atletico at home last season for example the newcastle and the southampton game they came after the ball the first 10 and 15 minutes both of them yeah. newcastle most surprisingly southampton completely changed their pressing structure to try and confuse liverpool's back line and i think more so given they had two midfielders and then it's like well they could play through us maybe so let's go as a wave rather than one then one then one which is how how Sanudel usually presses and i i think it, it's as much a mental thing that aspect of let's go and frustrate them Let's not let them set into a rhythm. You know, if you just allow Liverpool to ping the ball around for the first 15 minutes to get comfortable, then it might be a really tough evening. So I thought both sides said, let's get in their faces. Let's try and make it uncomfortable for them. Let's make them frustrated. And then we'll try and see out 60 minutes. We'll sit, you know, we'll try and get a goal. If we don't, we don't. And then we'll sit back for 60 minutes and watch them pass it around to themselves and, and see if they can create anything. And, and the issue in the final third, to me, Joel had a great piece about the chain reaction effect of moving Henderson out of the midfield and what it means for the right side of the ball structure and everything having to sag a little bit deeper because you've not got that usual defensive solidity of having Gomez and Van Dijk. The big thing for me in the final third is that there is no depth to the attack. That's the problem. When you when you sit against either a bank of five and four or two banks of four, they're at two horizontal levels. You can't then go and ha allow yourself to just stand at two levels, which is often what they do. You know, you watch Liverpool for 10 minutes, tippy-tappy the ball around the box. You know, there's movement, so it looks like there's purpose, but there's no depth, there's no surge. There's nothing that's a bit of a wild card, a bit of an X factor. Those Robertson underlaps, Oxley Chamberlain, fantastic. It suddenly comes ripping around the outside and the right, and it's like, oh, hello, there's some purpose to this going forward. They don't build any levels into the attacking movement anymore. I think Bobby is completely crowded out. He's not making much space for himself. I think that has to do with the structures I wrote about this week. Uh, and it's just all too predictable. And it's kind of like, well, we'll have the ball for a bit and we're good enough that we'll make some chances. And it, it's a bit too static. And they need to find a way to almost move backwards to create some more depth into the attack to bring some purpose, I think. 
there's a, there's a couple of good pieces that, that you wrote, Joel, yesterday on, as Ollie references, that, that triangle on the right is a really interesting one that I've picked up on myself in that I think people were very quick to lament Alexander-Arnold on Monday. And <clears throat> in some cases, rightly so, you know, he had a bad game. Can't get away from that. But there's there's a lot of times, as you picked up on, where he's getting his head up and there's nothing in front of him within sort of 30, 40 yards. Whereas he's used to a pass to Henderson on his outside, a pass to, to Salah maybe on his inside. And that triangle builds the play in wide areas. We've seen it the other side. At, at its best, you probably see it with Wijnaldum, Keiter and Robertson. Uh, with Wijnaldum, sorry, um, Mane and Robertson. But Keiter's all, also done a bit there. It's the other thing as well that you wrote that was that was really prevalent was was crosses and it's almost like Liverpool are being roped doped in a way that they they've not allowed themselves to be before I think and that crosses is a classic example of Southampton saying yeah more than happy for you to get whatever it was the other night something ridiculous like seventeen balls into the box or whatever with, with no chances attached to them because it's. Any centre half in the league, it's going to be a meet and drink for, and and that's not what Liverpool do. Again, it's not, it's not how Liverpool build attacks, as Ollie says. It's, it's almost crossing for crossing's sake because you're out of ideas. It's not we're playing for a second ball. It's not we're laying a trap. There just seems to be a lack of yeah, a lack of ideas at the moment, and you know how do how do they get that back? Yeah, I think as, as a general rule, when Liverpool are crossing the ball loads or it becomes their sort of main source of attack, it, it's usually a sign that, they're, that something's gone wrong and they've run out of ideas. Um, I, was, I was looking into the numbers in the last three games, Southampton, Newcastle and West Brom, it's 96 crosses Liverpool have put into the box um, and two of them have produced a shot on target. And that was Firmino's header late on against West Brom, which is a brilliant save. And there was another header um, first half against Newcastle, which was kind of quite comfortable for Darlow. So that's 94 crosses, which have basically either been cleared um, or Liverpool haven't gotten the ends of it or it's just gone straight out of play. Um, and yeah, you're right to say they're, they're making it far too easy um, for teams to defend. And I think crossing per se is not a problem. It's not a bad thing. Liverpool have two of the best crosses of a ball in world football in Trent and Robertson. That's why they've got the ridiculous amount of assists they have over the past few seasons. But when basically your entire attack comes down to just shuttling the ball out wide and that is where they're crossing from and the kind of balls they're putting in. I think when you look at their kind of most dangerous crosses, it's either when they're they're whipping it in with pace into space for someone to run onto or they've got into those positions where they've they've got a run in behind and they're cutting it back low and hard and they're fizzing it across the box because that's exactly what defenders don't want. What they do want is what we've seen against Southampton. I think it was 43 crosses in that game and so many of them which is from deep areas and there was sort of the high looping cross towards the six yard box trying to get the ball in the right vicinity um but not actually looking for a man and then when you've got kind of two center backs like Bednarek and Stevens are just going to stand there and head balls away they're quite happy doing that um for 90 minutes and um, to come back on your point about the the right side of triangle I think that's that's massive at the moment because the way the way we talk about partnerships in football people talk about the front three or the center back partnerships or midfield I think in this Liverpool team, especially in recent years when they've been at their best, it's been the relationship between the fullbacks and the wide forwards. So, as you mentioned, Robertson and Mane have a brilliant kind of understanding and, and so do Salah and Trent. And when one of them is off and you're missing the link man in the middle, which is Henderson, um, you know, there were points last season when it was Fabinho as the six who was holding it all together and Henderson was the one on the right. And he wasn't necessarily being brilliant himself, Henderson, but he was... He was making all kinds of space, passing angles and stuff, which allowed Trent and Salah to be as influential as they were. Um, and I don't think it's a coincidence that when Trent's on his game, Salah's usually on his game because there's that clip ball down the line that gets Salah in those one-on-one -on -one situations. And when Salah comes inside, Trent's got more space to kind of control the game from out wide. Um, and yeah, I just thought that was massively evident uh, against Southampton that, again, I agree, Trent's decision-making, his positioning and everything was poor. Uh, I think it was 38 times he gave the ball away, but so much of it, firstly, he was receiving it deeper um, than he usually would, like well inside Liverpool's own half. And when he did, he had a man straight on him. It was usually Gineppo, I think it was, on the left-hand side for Southampton, closing him down. And there was just no one, basically, anywhere near him on the right-hand side. There was Oxlade-Chamberlain, who 
you know, I like him as a player, but he was he was so far off the pace, and I'm, I'm not sure we quite knew what he was meant to be doing in that particular role. Um, and the gaps between Trent and Salah were just enormous. I think Salah completed 11 passes in that game, um, which just sort of shows you um, there was just nothing basically going on in terms of interplay and and movement down that right hand side. And yeah, when you take that out and you've sucked Henderson back into centre back, like Ollie said, alongside Fabinho and you know, two of that midfield three who Liverpool had on the pitch have been out for months with long-term injuries. Um, Thiago, as brilliant as he is, is still learning what that position is. He's still getting used to the pace of a league. Um, and yeah, that's just a huge part of Liverpool's identity, which when they've been at their best under Klopp, um, it's been so central. And at the moment, it's just, it's completely evaporated. And I think going forward, if they can find a way to get Henderson back in that right-sided eight role, close to Salah and Trent, um, I think that could make a massive difference going forward. Where the answer lies is is an interesting one, and and obviously there's talk of bringing players in, especially centre backs, to try and to try and fix this. Mark is is signing the centre back simply something that that fixes the problems for Liverpool currently, or is it a problem that now goes beyond that? In your opinion, um, obviously the obvious answer is yes. They obviously need a centre back because you know. Play going to a, any league game with two midfielders, Fabinho and Henderson, as, as co- capable as both are. I mean, Fabinho probably more so than Henderson, but they're both capable of playing there. You can't go into a, any league game, whether it's Southampton away, you know, any Burnley at home, whoever it is, you can't go into any league game when you're chasing for the title with relying on those two. With all due respect to them, you have to have, um, if it's just someone who is a recognised centre back, whether it's on a short term deal or potentially for the long term, you've, you've got to have someone who's comfortable and understands the role um now i mean that's that's the obvious answer but it also you just you lose so much when you have fabinho and henderson like not in midfield this brings so much to the the way the team play i think part of the reason the team just looks so stifled in midfield and, turn, and creatively is they haven't got someone like fabinho who is capable of you know playing those like looping passes in behind the back line for like salary or money to run on to like henderson with his energy who can Basically, run box to box, pretty much, pretty much do anything you ask of him. When he's been asked to play deeper or even in defence, you lose that. You lose, um, you just lose the creativity in that respect. So, as much as Liverpool need a centre back because they haven't got any recognised fit ones at the moment, you know, Matip, I think as good as he is, I just don't think you can rely on him um, long term or hardly even in the short term these days. You know, he's absolutely fantastic, which is one of the most frustrating things about him. You know. On his day, he's one of the top five centre backs in the league, but he's not on his day long enough purely because he's not fit. And if he's not fit, then you know you can't really plan for the season with him. You've got Van Dijk and Gomez on the sidelines, so you know that's three centre backs gone. Like they, they only went to the season with three anyway, uh, recognised. So after they let Lovren go, uh, at the time we all thought that was a gamble, and it's pretty much been you know the worst case scenario in that regard. So as much as Liverpool need a centre back to you know, strengthen the back line. I think they need it as much as anything else for also to allow these, like Mahenson and Fabinho, to come back into midfield because I just think they lose so much when they're not there. Is this is this harder than we think, Holly? I mean, we've had the James Pearce report today in the Athletic about Liverpool being unlikely to move for a centre-back in this window. We can't... I think my argument is we can't have this both ways. You know, we can't have the... The, the the Michael Edwards sort of party that every time he, he strikes gold in this league and, and unearths to Diogo Jota. Um but we, we that that comes with a price, I guess is what I'm saying. That comes with, you know, diligent research, that comes with taking the time to spot something, but it also comes with picking the right time to go for the player. You know, you've got to you've yeah. got to have the timing right and, and maybe right now the timing just isn't right. I guess that the thing is that they must have been looking in the summer. There's no way they let Dayan Lovren go and didn't have a list of candidates. I mean, they were sniffing around Lloyd Kelly for 18 months before he made his move to Bournemouth. So they all clubs have a rolling long-term list of targets. It's just whether you can maybe make the deal at the right time. Obviously, the guys they would want are probably playing in the Champions League. That That's where you get into a difficult thing. And the two of them might be playing against them in March. You know, so that, That's the real problematic yeah. part. I think that the short-term answer 
is the really tricky thing because you're just not going to find someone that Klopp will trust, that will fully understand the complexity of the system. And you can spin it both ways. Well, is that okay just to roll it for six months and hope for the best? I think you should just get a warm body in. And yeah, if they don't raise to the level and Reese Williams is the best option on a Saturday or Jordan Henderson is, then that's fine. At least you still got that warm body in case Matip goes down again or Fabinho goes down. Um, if it's someone who is kind of in the Klopp ecosystem, it's someone in the Bundesliga where he gets a great recommendation off one of his friends and they say, look, we play a similar style. We one-on-one -on -one defend and we think he can do it for you for six months. It could be someone you can spin and resell in 18 months. I, I don't think this concept, they have to go and get an open Meccano or someone who can push Van Dijk or Gomez into the future, I think is a bit silly. If, it just ha if it's just a fourth choice centre-back from wherever who they think can fit in for 18 months and then have some resale value or they can send out on loan and not have to cover the wages, that to me is fine. I just think they need something in there so that it's an option, whether it's to rotate or they strike gold and, hey, look, we've got someone who might help us defend the title. I, I, I suppose if the question is, Joel, do you think they can still challenge for the title if they don't make any any signings in january i mean we, we have to we have to separate the two to an extent don't we you know we, we can't just say that this liverpool team might struggle for top four if if they don't sign a center back in january that the, the top of the league you know th th they've got themselves to a point whereby they're right in the business and the right within you know the talking points of of things if they continue on this form i'm not talking the past three games i'm talking the first half of the season then when trophies come to be won, Liverpool will be in that conversation. It's, is it not just a case that it's more inevitable that a team will have a dip in form in this season, especially? And, you know, we have to accept that of Liverpool and we have to accept that in this season they might have more than one of those. It's just about sort of getting out of it as quick as you can. I think so. I think, Matt, if you said to me, and I think I've had this view all along, if you could keep Massive and Fabinho fit pretty much for the remainder of a season, I would make Liverpool favourites for the title and probably to go quite deep in the Champions League as well. I think Ollie's point there, and I mentioned it this morning on our call as well, no one seems to be talking at the moment about Fabinho um, and the possibility of him getting injured. And I know you can't predict these things, but it's almost like we're taking for granted the fact that he's just going to be there as a constant for the next five months. And the thing is, he's not had a full season at Liverpool. He's always had at least one injury where it's been an ankle problem or I think he picked up a hamstring injury earlier this season. Uh, and everyone's talking about the centre-back problem now as if he's going to be there and we just need someone to partner him to get through this season. And my, I think my concern at the moment is if this season's told us anything, is that you can't just rely on that. And when you're already as thin on the ground as we are, I almost, yeah, I, I kind of don't include Matip in Liverpool's plans for this. It's not anything to do with his ability. I think he's great, like Mark said, but you almost can't depend on him being available at any point for the remainder of a season or next season, um, for that matter. So I think kind of if you take that into account and you just imagine a scenario where, say, two months' time, Fabinho, because he's been playing every single game for the last three months, picks up a muscular injury, he's out for six weeks, Liverpool have a Champions League quarter final against whoever. And you're going into that with Reese Williams, Nat Phillips, and an out of position Henderson, who you'd want in midfield. That is what worries me right now. Or if you're going into a Premier League title run in and Liverpool are neck and neck at the top of the league with City or, or United or whoever, and they need to win five of their last seven games um, and draw the other two, and they'll win the league. And you've got Phillips, Williams, and Henderson. I mean, that <laughs> there's no disrespect to those guys because I think they've done well when they've been asked to play there under really difficult circumstances. You know, Williams is, is 19, was playing non-league last year. Nat Phillips is playing in the German second division. So for them to come in and do what they have done, they deserve credit for that. And Henderson as well, dropping back. But I think given what Liverpool are trying to achieve, I just think the risk of not doing anything is just far too big. It almost... I don't want to go too drastic, but it, it almost feels like you'd kind of be giving up on the season if you didn't at least try. Um, it, it would be the first time, honestly, where the, the accusations of the ownership cheaping out would be would be real. Because I've said this to you guys a ton of times, you will recoup the money by making the semi-finals of the Champions League and winning the league title. The prize money alone, let alone the marketing and the merchandise that comes from having to you know put those bumper stickers everywhere to to not do a five million installment deal or 10 million or a loan deal on someone you believe in i understand a short-term option is really hard 
given what you need from this position. But even just have it in your back pocket, like Joel said, if it gets to a, a crisis situation in the Champions League, if Matip goes down again, it really would be cheaping out. And, and, and it's not like these guys have a 10-year run in them. We're talking about a four-year window, maybe, probably three. And you, you're not only going to get so many chances to win league titles, it's really hard to defend the league title. I think six teams ever have done it, not clubs, teams. It's really hard to do it. So to just say, like, well, we'll go in with it with the lad from non-league football and the lad from the German second league, who the manager's already clearly said, like, look, it's it's just not happening. They, they cost them so much on the ball um, that he just cannot afford to basically plant Nat Phillips there for 90 minutes. I, I just, that seems to me, it seems short-sighted. I don't understand why you have to have a... Having a long-term view is fantastic, but they've built the thing now. Now it's about sustaining it. You're allowed to take a six-month approach when it's about winning league titles and European Cups, which is the goal of this thing. They should be in the, the hunt for a treble. They have the best squad in England in terms of overall top-end talent and how deep that talent runs. Maybe Completely. Chelsea. Success, success pays for itself. I think that's that's the point Ollie's making. I completely agree with it. Like They're in the sweet spot right now. We went into this season talking about dynasties, you know, Liverpool building from last season and, and this becoming not just a one-off title but something that they can repeat and match it with european success and that's kind of what's at stake here they've done really well to manage all the adversity they've had so far this season and get themselves to a point where they are still in contention even if they're not as far clear as we would like them to be or they don't have the big lead at the top that we were used to last season they are still in the mix and that's all you could ask for at this point and i think that's why it feels so urgent that even if they can't get their ideal centre back who fits the system and it's the right price and will be there for the next five or six years. Getting someone in, um, not just because it strengthens centre back, but it allows you more options in midfield. It helps the full backs. The knock on effect helps further up the pitch as well. That alone, to me, feels worth compromising a little bit. Um, and also, I think the other kind of unspoken factor we've not mentioned here at all none of us know what kind of Virgil van Dijk or Joe Gomez we're getting next season. We hope that they're going to be fit come kind of the summertime and hopefully they get the preseason and they'll be back in for the start of the next one. But it could take them a long time. We don't know if they'll ever get back to the levels they're at. We hope that is the case. Um, but the point is Liverpool probably do need a centre-back, at least one, maybe even two centre-backs within the next sort of 12 months anyway, not least because it means they don't have to rush those two back um, before they're ready and they can allow them kind of a long time to, to bed in again. So... For me, you have to bring those plans forward. And I just keep thinking of that scenario. Just imagine what happens if Matip, um, Fabinho is injured at the same time as Matip. We're not that far away from that being kind of a realistic thing. And I think that I think that has to be at the forefront of the thinking here. Just I also, quickly, Dan, sorry, go on. sorry, mate. It, it's a, for the club that is run on, you know, analytics and numbers and that type of thing, it's a basic probabilities thing and a margin of error. Does adding a sense back, even if he's not good, guarantee them the league title? Absolutely not. But does it increase the margin of error? Yes. That It's that simple to me. Yeah. And, and also, my argument for it would be that you need it for the dressing room. Mm -hmm. you, know, you think about your Warriors in that dressing room, you think about players like Robertson, Henderson. Salah, Salah Mane, players who are going to do the well for you every single week, they've got to be knocking on the manager's door going, who are we signing, Gaffer? Because mm -hmm. we're not doing all this for no medal at the end of the season. You know, these are players who are built on a winning formula. And I think I think you both make a really good point that in a roundabout way that what this is now is a squad that knows the system and a squad that knows how this team performs on the pitch. And if you've got a Phillips or a Williams in there, they know that there's there's a massive sort of red arrow in that position. You can't you can't just look after yourself in this team. One thing feeds another so much. And if one part of it is off, the whole thing is off. And I I I'd hasten to guess that is partially what's wrong with Alexander Arnold right now, by the way. Because it's that right centre back position which keeps getting changed which keeps getting altered and which keeps meaning he's got a different person to look at and look out for each week, which is probably having an effect on his game, if you were to ask him honestly. Um, so, all that being said, we're probably not going to answer him on. So, um, <laughs> let's see how that plays out. Uh, Aston Villa, tomorrow, Mark. Um, one where we previously thought Jürgen Klopp might not even be here, let alone the players. We thought that to get um, a bit of a bit of reference to the, the first team we thought it might be a repeat of last season. All looks very different now, doesn't it? Yeah, I mean, 
um, I said before the start of the season, I'd love to see Liverpool go deep in the FA Cup. I mean, I think the furthest they've gone in the competition in Klopp's time is like the fifth round. I don't think we've got, even got to the quarterfinals um, in what, five, six seasons, whatever it is that Klopp's had um, in the competition now. So from a personal perspective, it'd be great to see us go deep in it. But from a realistic point of view, when the injuries that they've got, you know, the comp- that the chasing the league title, they've got the Champions League as well. Realistically, go- realistically going deep in the FA Cup is going to be a very, very tough challenge, especially when you look at the form that they've got over the last three games going into it. But in terms of like the team and the players that we expect to see, it's definitely not going to be the same team or a similar approach to what we saw against um, Shrewsbury last season, where it was basically just the kids going, going for it, giving it all they've got and resting the first teamers for the league games coming ahead. I think whether that's the last three games have changed that approach, I don't, I don't think so. But I think we'll start to see a lot more first team players playing. I think, you know, I think they'll only probably rest two or three of the, of the main guys. for being there. I think there's got to be rested. Like like Joel said, he goes down, the whole thing falls apart. So I think he's got to be protected at all costs and only play when he has to. Robertson's another one. He's played, like I say, he looked absolutely exhausted against Southampton. You can't blame him. The amount of minutes he's played both for Liverpool and for Scotland this season. It's remarkable that he's playing consistently as well as he is. Like It's just ridiculous. Um, and aside from that, you know, I don't think you risk Thiago at this point. I don't think he is worthy of a risk. I think you're just getting ready for United, getting ready for the big game at United at Anfield in just over a week's time. Aside from that, it could be pretty much any team we expect. I mean, whether we'll see Allison in goal, I don't I don't think so. You'd probably think he'll give Kelleher a go for that. But aside from that, I think you won't be surprised if you see some of the, all the main guys starting. Maybe not all the front three. I think maybe we'll see some interchange in there with maybe Shakiri, Minamino. Maybe even Divock Origi, we don't know. We don't know at this point with him, but yeah, I think there's certainly going to be a lot more full strength. That, well, not necessarily full strength, but certainly more senior members of the squad that we would have expected um, earlier in the season. That's for sure. On, on Thiago, though, right? I, he's one player I probably will play in this. I think he's done start of the Premier game, and that that form that goes hand in hand for me with the concept of Liverpool playing themselves out of this, regardless of what the occasion is. I think any defeat now for Liverpool is going to be compounded in something that they really need to put a stop to. So I'm not saying, you know, play your strongest team against the left. But what I'm saying is there's a team there that you can put out that, A, get games into the legs of the likes of Thiago, Oxley, Chamberlain, Jaden Chiquiri, players that need games in Amino. And it's still good enough to be Dak and Villa, by the way, like what happened there earlier in the season. Um, but also, you know, this is a this should be a game that Jürgen Klopp has to for to win, and and that sounds very, sounds very sick, But you know, we know where his priorities lie when it comes to competitions. I think that needs to go out the window a little bit, in my opinion. I think that playing the occasion now is far lesser than sort of the need to actually win a game of football, which this Liverpool team need to do and need to do quickly. Yeah, I remember when the draw was made for this one, <laughs> I remember thinking it was one of the worst Liverpool possibly could have got, firstly being away from home against a team who are in brilliant form in general this season. Um, have lots of players who've just had a quite a recent experience of putting seven goals past Liverpool, so they will go into that with confidence. Um, and you could say it works the other way, but Liverpool will want to kind of prove a point um, after what happened there. But it is a tricky one. It's a tricky one for the manager as well. Um, like you mentioned, I think by the time we get to United at Anfield, some of the team who played against Southampton, if they didn't play this one, would have gone I think it's 12 or 13, nearly two weeks, basically, without playing a competitive match, which you probably going into a game like that, you don't really want. Um, so there is an argument definitely that for kind of rhythm and momentum, you, you do want these guys to kind of play. And I think someone like Thiago, who who struggled a little bit, I think we'd all say against Southampton, um, wasn't helped by, again, everything going on around him. It was a difficult game. But I think for him to kind of learn that role, get used to his teammates, just get kind of minutes in his legs, really. He's been out for, what was it, two and a half months since the derby. Um I think that if Liverpool can go into the United game with a, a sharper Thiago than the one ahead against Southampton, that might be worthwhile. Um, again, I'd, I'd almost even be 
tempted to play Trent and it might feel a bit harsh on Nico Williams not giving him this game but I just felt off the back of what happened against Southampton um, you, you want him to get that out of his system and there's guys like Oxley, yeah there's guys like Oxo Chamberlain who again need the minutes um, Mane is probably one that I think you don't feel so bad about resting it's not like he's as desperate to kind of score goals as Salah is it doesn't feel like it affects him as much um, so I wouldn't wouldn't necessarily be too fussed about resting him in this one, having him as an option off the bench. Minamino is one who I feel, I mean, we've talked about endlessly on these podcasts, but I, I do feel a little bit of sympathy for because he comes in against Palace, scores, doesn't play brilliantly, but has, I think, probably his best all-round game for Liverpool, at least in the league. And I don't think he's even got off the bench since then. He's literally not got a look in. Um, and if you're him and you're thinking, look, I've got my big break, I've scored my goal, played a big part in a 7-0 win, and then you're out the picture for three games and Liverpool don't win a single one of them. You've got to be knocking on Klopp's door saying, come on, give me this one. Um, yeah, the, the defence, I, I just don't know what he does there because, like you said, you'd be terrified of Fabinho picking up a knock in this one ahead of the United game with the options that Liverpool have. But then are you asking Phillips and Williams? I guess that's probably what you have to do. Um, I'd also probably gamble on just giving Milner the game at left back. He won't, he won't want to do it, but Robertson's one, I think, who looked absolutely, like Mark referenced, shattered. Um, he's been brilliant this season, but yeah, he looked like he was out of energy against Southampton. So I think we will see more first-teamers than we have seen in recent seasons, definitely for a cup game. And I I would obviously like to see Liverpool win it, but I do think the circumstance, you just want to change the mood, basically, um, because I think going into United off the back of a defeat to Villa, given what's happened in the last three games... I think as much as possible, you want to avoid that and, and just lift the atmosphere. Absolutely. Oli, final words with you. I mean, you made a very good point yesterday about when this squad looks back, will it have amassed, amassed enough trophies? You know, when mm. this team, this this era of this team looks and is judged by history, you know, will we have enough pots there to say, to justify basically telling how everyone else how good they were and, and yeah. they, they really were winning an FA Cup, whether people like it or not, adds to that. And and it would not be a bad thing, put it that way. Yeah, people view it as irrelevant and have kind of taken on Klopp's mantra because he seems to view it as irrelevant. But once you get to the end of this thing, and it's going to be, and you guys can tell me if this is overall, but I really do think there's going to be a legacy battle over who was the team of the era. You know, you go through Michaels, yeah. Cruyff onwards, the t- teams of a generation, it will be Guardiola City versus Klopp's Liverpool. Klopp has the European Cup right now, which is the trump card, but let's just say for argument's sake, Guardiola winds up getting one. Suddenly he's going to have a roll call of FA Cups and League Cups and these things to stack up 100 points. And, you know, that, that that's that's the match winner there. So I, I think I think it's important. I think you go back, it's 10 years this week since Kenny Daglish took over the, the club for his short spell. And the first thing he identified is, OK, all that stuff about how you have a great team and isn't Fernando Torres and Javier Mascarano great. What did they win? They won nothing. You came second yeah. in the league. Yeah. Didn't, those guys didn't win an FA Cup, didn't win a League Cup. Luis Suarez left Liverpool having won a League Cup maybe the best player in the modern history of the club. You won a League Cup, that was it. They have to win stuff. And Liverpool are in a position this year where they can't take any competition for granted, frankly. Might not win the league. Might not win the Champions League. You have to, with this core, you have to win something each and every year. And you have to end the thing with at least 10 trophies, 10 medals. That would be my goal. And here's a chance to go get one. I will play the strongest team possible outside of Robertson and Fabinho. Those will be the only guys off the limit. I have no care about the worries of getting uh, minutes into the legs of players right now outside from Thiago. No worries about the emotions of Takumi Minamino. Got to go win football matches. This team needs to win a football match. It needs to win it with some kind of either style or digging themselves out against a tough opponent, which is what this one will be. That just really elevates the mood going into United. So I think he has to be as strong as possible and he has to view the competition differently this year as one we should win. That should be the goal. Absolutely. Um, we will be covering the game on thepill.com. All the pieces we've referenced are over there on the website, so give that a, a, a look and a read. Um, and most importantly, we hope you're all well, given the circumstances of the current day. Um, we will be back next week. We will be covering Aston Villa, and we will be on thepill.com each and every day with written features for you to look at and delve into. So until then, uh, take care of yourselves and each other. See you soon.